Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we uh, explore the intersection of emerging tech, culture, our lives, the world, humanity, big stuff. My name is Jeremy hey. Gilbertson. I am a, uh, yeah, I'm a founder of something called Right to Know You that uh, is getting put out in the ether uh, this year. I love exploring a bunch of other things. Mark Fielding is my co-host and he is a lore developer, a writer, uh, one that's been really diving into the Web3 realm mark how are you doing today man what's happening hey jeremy yeah i'm doing great thank you and because we're going to be talking about bitcoin today and etfs and finance did i actually tell you i actually won my first bitcoin i actually won my first bitcoin for for writing about the network state for balaji svin rissasan how we pronounce his name wow um, how long ago was that it was a few years like before that i was actually came into crypto via the altcoin entrance um for whatever reasons and yeah my yeah i, I won it for writing about the network state which i think is uh, <laughs> an interesting way to enter bitcoin i don't know about you but that's not a bad little payday for writing a little piece of uh of literature it's, it's, yeah it's worth more than when i won it so amazing Good that's all that's awesome um so hey quick shout out and then we're going to dive right into this because there's some big stuff happening in the world uh as of yesterday related to this topic yeah. but uh again we want to we want to always uh acknowledge and shout out our wonderful sponsor ripple w-r-i-p-p-l-e.com marketing's on demand talent platform these guys have figured out a way to um stack teams of interdisciplinary creatives and doers to apply to special projects that you are working on of which mark and i are on the platform so if yeah. you like what you hear from us jump on ripple and uh see what you can find out but i'll mark, be there mark what are we talking about today man what's what's going on so yeah in, in case you're living under a bushel yesterday the sec finally confirmed the the spot be spot bitcoin etfs um, and today, how do we do it, Jamie? How do we time it? So, well, we have like this serendipitous timing at the moment where our guests kind of correspond to what is happening in the world. Like, well, like I do have, I, I've got an Oracle. See the glowing thing behind me right there. Uh, you go it there is? Yeah, it's an Oracle. You go figure things out back there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause when, when we, when we booked our guest Marcus Tillian today, we didn't know that the day before he came on that the, the sec would confirm the ETF. So yeah, I guess Marcus Tillian, he is the author of this book, Crypto Titans, How Trillions Were Made and Billions Were Lost in the Crypto Markets. He's also um, an, the author of another book, Bitcoin, The Irresistible Rise. He's head of research and strategy for a digital investment firm. He appears frequently on CNBC, Bloomberg, Coindesk, all of the media outlets in crypto to speak about Bitcoin and the crypto markets. And yeah, I've been enjoying reading the Crypto Titans book. So yeah, let's get our guest on, Marcus. Yeah, and the, the biggest thing, that, well, the last thing before I bring Marcus on is the, the biggest thing that I'm so interested in, he's done such a great job of documenting the story yeah. of Bitcoin and the rise and, and, and all of that in a very interesting narrative way. So we're going to talk about the beats on the journey. Let's welcome Marcus to the show. How are you, sir? Welcome. Hey, guys. Doing very well. How are you? Doing real well. Yeah, doing real well. It's a uh, it, the timing as Mark said is is super interesting uh as a, as of yesterday, but we all know there's a lot of different uh as we say beats to this story. Um give us give us a, a short little background of what kind of sparked your interest uh in in capturing the narrative of Bitcoin when you first did it with your first book. Yeah, for me it was uh you know just really Kind of putting it all together right i mean every day we hear we talk about you know stable coins you know we talk about binance but when the you know when it was for example stable coin really started right and when did they really gain popularity and i think you know when i when i went through a lot of these dates uh you know i discovered first of all you know a lot of the the last few years right even you know of course we know bitcoin is around you know the last 15 years and and actually the groundwork for for bitcoin has been actually done already in the 90s right if not even before so it was just really you know putting and piecing it together that you know apparently satoshi nakamoto has done as an individual or as a group but for me it was more kind of you know because i've been in in based in asia for a long time so crypto has been around there you know forever it was used for or it is still used for various uh, you know activities I, I must say but but it was really just you know like there were different waves right and i trying was trying to put like a 
kind of like like a method to to the to, to the madness really right and we know this from you know from from trad five from normal finance you know here's you know the central banker hiking interest rates being aggressive or here's an election and you look back and suddenly you know the stock market exploded or crashed or something and i think you know i was looking for kind of those events as well uh and i think you know it's actually quite uh, predictable you know where kind of crypto goes because crypto is just not a universe by itself it's part of the you know the global asset cycle the global liquidity cycle and i was just trying to piece those pieces together in the book Amazing. Let's. So uh, I know we want to dive into some of the history uh, of of how this this phenomenon emerged over time. But let's talk about the timeliness of of what happened yesterday and and how that applies to uh, to to the asset itself. Yeah. So you know, last night, yesterday, the SEC, the U.S. you know regulator for securities, basically allowed that Bitcoin can be traded in the form of an ETF, which is an exchange traded fund which is sort of like a basket or a wrapper, uh, you know, how people trade like a whole index or a sector. If you want to buy, you know, the whole, you know, U.S. banking sector, you can just buy it through like an ETF. You don't need to buy each stock by itself. So it's easy from like an operational perspective. It's easy from execution perspective. And this is what's going to happen with these uh, with these Bitcoin ETFs as well. Suddenly, you can actually buy them in your normal portfolio, be it, I don't know, be it Robinhood, be it Interfere Brokers, be it, you know, whatever you have, Fidelity, Swap, and so on. But what's very important is, uh, depending, of course, what, what, what kind of sizable or knowledgeable client you are, you can actually borrow money against your stocks, right? So if you have, you know, if you have, I don't know, $100 in your, in your account, you know, you can actually buy, you know, stocks are worth $120, million, $120 or $150, depending, you know, how volatile these stocks are. And from now on, actually, you can do this also with, with Bitcoin. So you can have, let's say, a million dollars in your portfolio. You're buying this Bitcoin ETF, and then you can buy another like 200,000 US dollars in stocks. So suddenly you can use this, you know, to basically marginalize your portfolio. You can, you can leverage, you can borrow. And I think this is, for me, this is a, a more interesting aspect, not just from a regulatory perspective, but we had, you know, this is in, based on my account, this is a, the fifth Bitcoin bull market that we have after 2011, 2013, 2017, and 2021. And each of those bull markets actually had a different way to acquire Bitcoin. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was more leverage and so on. I mean, it's just, it's just like a natural progression. But it is very interesting because now it can become, you know, a building block in institutional investors' portfolios. So can I ask a, a stupid question on the ETF? Because um, who is it now available for? Because like ETFs existed outside of America before this. Is that correct? So this is the first American-based Bitcoin ETF. Who can buy into an ETF? Yeah, so I think what's what's you know extremely important, uh, and it's probably like a deeper question than you probably imagined, but but ETFs are extremely common, extremely used in the U.S. They're not really common in Asia. In Asia, people think you know they want to trade the stock specifically, right? They don't want to buy the whole basket. They don't have a view about the you know the the, the Chinese banking sector or the Asian banking sector. They want to have like a specific view about JP Morgan because they have a buddy at JP Morgan who told them like great things or something like that. So and in the US, you have a lot of uh, institutional investors, uh, registered investment advisors. So there are like 15,000 registered investment advisors in the US that overseeing something like 5 trillion or some other estimates are more. And you know when they talk to their clients uh, or to their basically to their end clients, you know, they, they say, for example, you should have 60% in stocks or 40% in bonds and, you know, switch it around a little bit. Uh, so they are heavy user of these, you know, these these uh, sector allocations, right, between bonds and, and stocks and so on and a little bit commodities. Um, and now this can be like a building block. So now it's really where people just can, you know, add it to, well, my portfolio should be 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Why don't I put like 5% in crypto through this ETF? Because, you know, the the SEC basically legitimized it now uh, as, a, as a, you know, regulated asset that can be part of uh, institutional portfolio. So that's like a whole different, uh, I guess, universe of investors that can come and, and use Bitcoin, you know, for, for, that, for that purpose, basically. So we we talked about this a little bit in, in the pre-show chat, pre chat, but the, the idea that, 
Bitcoin was initially received, you know, kind of from the SEC as maybe something that is not, and I'm going to use very vague terms, not awesome, right? But now that is very vague, <laughs> right? But but now but now, what what do you think the reason is? Where where they can say, hey, this is great for an ETF, but I still don't like it necessarily from an individual buying it perspective. Yeah, they haven't said it's great. I think the wording of their announcement is it almost feels like we had to do this to me rather than we wanted to do this. Yeah, I think very simple. It's public and uh, political pressure. I think that's that's really the outcome. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of people that want to have exposure. There's a lot of people who said, like, you know, I've missed out the last couple of years. You know, I just want to have some exposure. I mean, nobody can really, um, you know, value it that that it that it tracks actually the valuation metric, right? I mean, for example, with stocks, you can say, well, there's, you know, price to earnings, there's price to book, and of course, you can make these kind of come up with these, I guess, you know valuation metrics is as well but the price of bitcoin doesn't really track it right so it's not suddenly the networks make, makes more money and therefore it should be valued like 10 times more or something like this so <clears throat> so i think it's really like a matter of where they say well you know everybody wants it so why don't we put it in sort of like the the you know more or less in a regulated environment and then people can can trade it but of course you know last night the vote was really three to one, uh, three, to, three to two. So it was like five commissioners, five SEC commissioners were voting and the vote was three to one. So it's uh, three to two. So it was not really uh, five, you know, five were in favor. So it was really like, it was, know, still, it was close. Yeah. So it was, it, it could have also gone the other way with, you know, with, with, with the SEC chair Gensler really being the deciding vote. And previously he has, you know, has been a very fierce critic uh, towards Bitcoin, and even you know, last night he issued he that this is you know for you know for for anything that he would love to see it used, and you know there's no justification really to to have it, and you know he was warning people uh, basically 48 hours through various tweets that this is really dangerous and very volatile, but he still has approved it, so it must be really that there has been you know a lot of you know pressure. You know, from these big big institutions like you know, like BlackRock, the the lobbying industry has become so powerful uh, because of the price of Bitcoin has risen so much that you know these companies have really the power to to you know to take on these uh, you know institutions now and these politicians. And I guess a lot of uh, people just really want to, have, you know, this is a good thing, their own decision really if if they want to have it or not. And and you know if it, you know it goes up, so why wouldn't you have a, you know why don't you want to have something in your portfolio, right? If it goes up, right? How much simple is that? So, how much validity is there in the naysayers who say that Bitcoin is volatile? All of the risk will go into retirement funds that can't afford to lose it. Is that based? Is there skepticism based on? a reality or is it based on fear mongering and the past you can also um, around like two three years ago we had this whole like spec right these special purpose acquisition corporations you know where company could suddenly list through the you know they, they a lot of regulation um you know, and it's just quite, I mean, there's a really also like, you know, really ama some really amazing examples about this, how companies put, could basically like lie about their revenues, expectations. And, you know, this whole basket of like SPAC companies just really crashed down by like more than 80%, right? And of course, you know, one, one of the triggers was actually also, um, you know, BlackRock in, in this case, when 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 Lucid, you know, the, the Tesla competitor was listed and the stock traded to like $60 sponsors they could suddenly buy at $15 so everybody kind of feel like they're getting a rug pulled here as well um, so it's just like a, a interesting you know commonality here by people want to speculate and I think it's really not in, in my view it's really not the, the regulators decision to decide what people should be speculating in 
in or not, right? And I think, uh, you know, suddenly uh, other things were, were allowed. And I think here the, the mismatch was really that in 2017, literally at the peak of, of the third bull market, the Bitcoin futures were listed at the CFTC. And then at the peak in, in 2021, uh, the, the Bitcoin futures, uh, the Bitcoin ETFs based on the futures were listed again, again at the peak of, of, of the previous bull market. So it's kind of like the regulator allows these products to be traded and there is no, was no coherent message really to the investor. And I think this is what in the end uh, they got backed into a corner and then basically they just had to allow this just not to look, you know, look as you know, less credible, I think, from, from the regulatory perspective. Got it. What? Um. So I want. I, I have one more question before we go into kind of the beats of the of the Bitcoin journey. Uh, so whether Satoshi is a person or a group, uh, how does Satoshi feel about this ETF approval? If you could speculate on that. Speaking of speculating, <laughs> well, I think you know the interesting aspect really is that um, you know that that there has been. You know, because the, the question is, right, should Bitcoin be more like gold or should Bitcoin be more like, like a transactional, you know, asset or vehicle really, right, that is used for, for a lot of transactions. And I think um, what also people are not aware of that there have been, there have been like several updates to the, to the Bitcoin code itself. So it's not something that he has developed and we are still running it. It's just quite the contrary. It's probably like 90% is just very different, right? People love to quote, you know, his his paper, but, you know, his paper has been like over, you know, have, have been like amended and changed and everything. So, and I think that the question really is, I think, you know, because Bitcoin was launched, you know, you know, within the, you know, the, I guess, you know, the, the, the deepest part of the global financial crisis, right, the GFC. So it was more kind of like as an alternative you know, store of, of, of value, right? Uh, that, that you bank with somebody else and you don't need to go through like a, like another, uh, you know, centralized, you know, exchange, right? But now we are on a centralized exchange here. So this is completely, I guess, opposite of what, what he was imagining, right? And, and also the idea was that you really store those Bitcoins on your own devices and I can send them to Mark and Mark can send it to you and you can send it to me without anybody in between, right? But of course, now if we're trading, you know, I sell you my my Bitcoin ETF, you know, through BlackRock on the exchange, you know, and so on. I mean, this is, of course, completely opposite, right? Because again, who is, you know, not your keys, not your coins, right? So who is holding, you know, those Bitcoins for you? It's like, you know, BlackRock or their custodian, uh, you know, Coinbase in, in that case, right? So you don't have access, you just have like a paper, like, well, you know, you own something, but this is the same thing as when when Satoshi developed it, that, you know, you should be independent of the banks. And we have seen like many times in history over the last kind of, you know, 10, 15 years, if there is a bank blow up, uh, usually Bitcoin rallies, right? Because again, for this aspect and, you know, it's difficult these days to bring, you know, to bring like, you know, a million US dollars worth of, of gold across borders. A few years ago, you could, you know, I don't know, like 100 years ago, you could do this, right? But these days, you cannot go through the airport, uh, you know, with even like 100K of, of gold, right? I mean, anything 10K you need to report. So, of course, with, well, you have it on a USB stick, you can just move, uh, you know, basically like borders. It's, it's, it's really, you know, transportable, which is with, with other things, it's not. So, yeah, I tried moving gold through the airport. It doesn't work. It's not even on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So now we're, yeah. So now we're in this interesting, it's going to be interesting to see what this, what this does over time, because when you have a, uh, a pro let's call it Bitcoin, let's just call it a product. I know that's not the right way to talk about it, but hear me out with this example. Whenever you have a new product or a new experience that doesn't meet the, uh, the, you know, the largest part of the market who could use that in the way they participate in the market. Right. So the, they're, let me try and get a little clearer with this. So like um, uh, ex investing with or buying Bitcoin is very different than buying something from a centralized bank, right? And the people, a large part of the population aren't familiar with how to get a wallet, how to transact through a wallet, that sort of thing. I think it's going to be interesting to see what the effects of this on overall adoption 
are down the road, whether it drives people who initially look at the ETF and go, well, hey, I could probably do this on my own, right? Um, I don't know that there was necessarily a question in there that, um, but uh, well, let's- But let's, I'll follow on from that just for a little one, just before we move on to the books, yeah. I really want to talk about crypto times because some of those early players in Bitcoin, it's, it was such a, a crazy, volatile, dangerous, flamboyant, creative time that it, it just we have to speak about a bit. But one thing, people are never happy. Everyone's always like, what's the next? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? And literally hours after the Bitcoin ETF, when Ethereum ETF, what does this what does it mean for the wider cryptocurrency industry? Um, what does it mean for altcoins, for want of a better description? Yeah, do we expect them to rally? Do we expect an Ethereum ETF by the end of the year? Is that something which, or should we just focus on Bitcoin? Yeah, I think there's like a, a few hugely important, you know, questions really in, in your in, in your comment, right? So, number one, there's another deadline for an Ethereum ETF uh, occurring on May 23rd this year. And we also have already Ethereum futures listed and we have uh, also, uh, you know, Ethereum ETFs based on futures. So it's almost like, you know, it's, it's like another step. And the, the chance or the likelihood is probably like 70, 80% that they're going to be approved as well. So in that sense, you know, Ethereum would then be classified you know, also that investors can can buy, and I think that's why we're seeing you know this this rally right now. The the hugely important aspect of of all this is really that you know the world the the world's regulators are really looking, I think, at the U.S. regulators what they are doing. There is not really like one you know sizable regulator in the world who says like let me lead like my country you know into the next digital age. I think they're all sort of like trying to hide a little bit behind the SEC or CFTC and so on. And I think what what we had, for example, over the last 12 months after the FTX implosion is that, you know, people were, were kind of like spreading the story or, oh, you know, crypto in the US, uh, you know, there's just there's so much regulatory overhang, nothing is going to happen here, you know, but where I sit, I mean, you know, from with my, let's say, finance career, you know, I worked for the all the large, you know, um, you know, banks that work for large U.S. hedge funds and so on. So the, the pool, the largest pools of capital are still in the U.S. And that's why this is so important that the SEC has moved now because it gives a green light to every other regulator in the world. They don't need to kind of like wait anymore. It's kind of like, okay, well, the SEC did this in the U.S. So we should be doing this in country A, B, C and so on, you know, as well. And I think that is really the interesting aspect. So now you actually, you probably have like, uh, you know, open the door to literally global adoption where global regulators can come out now and say like, you know what, we want to offer these products as well. Because, you know, I mean, I kind of grew up with, you know, with trading currencies. I grew up with trading, you know, commodities and stocks and it's exciting. But a lot of young people, they're just, you know, it's just, it's just not fast enough, right? I mean, the, you know, I mean, there's this great comment like Bitcoin is never boring and it's just so true, right? I mean, I mean, this year, right, which is like, you know, we are 11 days in. It just is so much that has, had, has already happened. I mean, it's just, you know, just crazy from like the price moves, you know, the stories, you know, all these things. So it's it's just like, you know, it's it's an, it's an industry that it moves so fast. You don't need to wait for the Apple earnings, you know, in, I don't know, let's say in, in, in April, you know, or the, then the next set of earnings, you know, three months later. I mean, this industry moves so fast. And I think there are so many people who can tap into this, this, this global ecosystem, really, of, of cryptocurrencies. And this is exactly what, you know, what, what Mark was sort of like implying. Is this going to open the floodgates now to altcoins and, and so other currencies? I, I would assume so, because, because you're going to get a lot of advertisements, you know, around the Super Bowl in the U.S., you know, that's coming up in, you know, in, in, in February um, you know, some people are going to say, well, do, can I really make like 10x with my with my Bitcoin here? Or, you know, should I rather look at other stories? And I think it's crypto is really like a mixture between, you know, technology, storytelling, 
you know, a vision of the future. So it just it just incorporates, you know, a lot of those things. That's why it's very exciting. And that's why yesterday's announcements is actually very important, not just for the US, but really globally. Yep. Yeah. So so the the, the official title of the show is Finding the Through Line uh, in Crypto <clears throat> Markets, right? So so we're all writers, we're all storytellers. A lot of our listeners are are as well. And we're all equally familiar probably with Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, right? So if we were to use that framework I like relate, it. related to the, the journey of Bitcoin, <laughs> what does the hero's journey look like for Bitcoin? And where are we? What and where are, yeah, and where are we in the act? Yeah. Well, the, the way how I look at it is if you would have bought Apple shares 20 years ago, right, you look like a hero now and you're probably financially, you know, done basically. Yeah. But 20 years ago, you had like you had like no idea about you know the iPhone, what the iPhone would be do you know due to everybody's you know activities, you know being on the phone all the time. You would have had no idea about you know uh, all these apps that really came like 2010, 11, 12, 13, and you know all these things that really came. You know that suddenly Apple became like massively popular, and I look I look at it a little bit, um, you know because. Because what was really the key trigger, right? The key trigger was suddenly it was like so cheap to use all these apps. You know, before, you know, I wanted to send you um, an SMS, it cost you like a dollar or something, right? You know, you couldn't really stream anything. But because of those streaming costs became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, suddenly you could just sit in, I don't know, in, in the train or whatever, in the car and just like stream, right? It was just like, well, yeah, it costs like a little bit, but it's not a fortune anymore. And because of those costs came lower, suddenly you know apple became like this really valuable company because suddenly people were using the phone right and i think here it might be something similar we might actually not know what bitcoin actually is right and i think this is really a little bit the problem that you know there's only like 21 million bitcoins you know, being handed around and something like 70 percent of the coins just don't move you know there's only like another let's say less than 2 million that's going to be mined over the next you know <laughs> literally 100 years and hundred, uh, yeah, hundred years now, but <clears throat> but a lot of the coins don't move. A lot of the coins are just like you know in cold storage. So get, getting <clears throat> excuse me, getting access to it might become very difficult. So I think that's also like an interesting story. That well, what if nobody sells bitcoins to you know to to the to the to the black rocks you know of the world now, right? What if people just like hoard them because it's also becoming more and more difficult. You know to mine them and maybe people are going to switch to a new currency or do something else or there will be different like parallel systems um so i think it's just kind of like an interesting thing but but i would make the argument that you know satoshi maybe had a different vision for it but maybe we just don't know what's happening because it depends a little bit on on how for example gas fees or transaction costs going to evolve what technology might be developed right i mean maybe somebody build some interesting technology stack on top of it and suddenly becomes like hugely valuable for micropayments. I mean, there are all these things and we just need to kind of like see what, what, what happens there. I love I that idea of all of the Bitcoins just been hoarded away and, <clears throat> and, and, and then nobody wants to move and it becomes like a, a standoff where who's going to sell their first Bitcoin? Who's going to sell their Bitcoin to BlackRock? And then nobody does and something else fills the vacuum. Well, it's, it's it's interesting that I mean, obviously, you know, the, the the limited supply makes makes the story a heck of a lot more interesting, right? But also, what what I thought, Marcus, you said earlier, with the Apple reference related to uh, the power of the network made Apple more valuable, right? And and the network being less expensive, right? And there's a network aspect, obviously, to to Bitcoin and what that network can do. Um, we always talk about emergent things versus hierarchical things. This is without a doubt an emergent thing that again, we're not going to know what happened, where, where this thing's going to go until we start seeing interactions on the network. Right. It's very interesting, right? Because we had something, you know, like ordinals really, you know, reappearing this year where, you know, where people can inscribe something on it. And, and, you know, you mentioned that, and I mean, this is something that Satoshi put actually in last minute. It was not one of the core thoughts, but it made it, of course, hugely valuable. And of course, we have seen, you know, splits away from Ethereum, you know, to other side chain. And, you know, that's really like also like an interesting question because the side chain also have, you know, some value, right? I mean, even, you know, we were talking about Ethereum. 
like up, for example, like Ted Ethereum Classic, which was like, you know, previous, previously forked, you know, was up like 30, 40%, uh, if even, I think even 50% today at one point, right? So, I mean, these are like interesting things that are interesting that engage with, but, but again, while some people are speculating, there is also like a large group of, you know, developers that are trying to do something useful with those, those things, right? And, and to just rule this out now and say, well, nothing is happening now. So therefore nothing will happen in the future. I mean, that's really difficult to say, right? That's really like, you know, saying, well, we have everything invented that we could invent. And that's what, that's exactly, I think the point that we might really not know what it is. And, and, you know, as Jeremy correctly said, the network, right? And I think this is what we are still building, but the network is becoming like bigger and bigger. And even if you have it just in your portfolio as, as, as an ETF, you will have more interest in it to really learn about it, right? And that's when the education starts when, and you know, a lot of uh, big hindrance has been like the user interface, you know, because it's difficult to have your coins, right? But maybe somebody will come up with something that is easily usable or you will be taught it in, in school, right? I mean, it's always interesting, you know, the older generation, they don't know Slack, you know, they, they know Blackberry, but they don't know Slack. And then there's other things, you know, the same with like Snapchat and Facebook. And I think this is also where people just kind of grow up naturally around these things right and maybe it's just kind of like this generational educational part that needs to be you know it's almost like you need to get one generation i don't want to say pass away but you know where to make, make get out the way it. get out the right. way yeah. you know, I, mean, I mean no but because I'm, I'm saying this because there's this interesting example when you know when like in in the in the you know 1920s when you had the stock market crash you know it took like 16 years for the market to come back because you had the, all these investors that didn't believe in stocks anymore. So you needed a new generation of people like, you know, hey, I have no idea about the crash. So I just buy because I think the price goes up. Right. But it's really when you're having these, you know, this, these, these, these scars about, you know, about history that it prevents you to open your mind to, to new things. And this is sometimes, you know, when you kind of grew up about, you know, with all, for example, all these scams, right. But the new people that are coming and there are always new people coming into crypto. This is why it's really so amazing. You know, they don't think about, you know, the scam or the rug pull or the Mount Gox or any of these exchanges, right? I mean, people forgetting about, you know, FTX now already, right? They're thinking about where's my opportunity. And I think this is really the, you know, the, the interesting aspect of crypto. And this is why crypto is is really part of the technology because it, it makes us envision about the future. And I think that is really the important part. Powerful, yeah. Yeah, one of the things speaking about the future and, and the story of Bitcoin, one of the one of the challenges that if Bitcoin was a character in the story, right? One of the challenges that Bitcoin will will wrestle with is is the effects on on the earth, right? So I, I read a study a long time ago and I I wish I had it to reference, but it it basically compared the mining of Bitcoin versus the mining of gold and found that the environmental impact on both were relatively equal, which is really interesting to me. Um, what, what as big, if you were advising Bitcoin as a character, right? What, how does the environment play into this thing and the power consumption and the stuff that we're already seeing with data centers in general uh, across the world? Yeah, of course, data centers are a huge consumer of, of energy, right? And I think, you know, I, I would assume you know, in, in a few years time, energy will just be really abundant, right? Which is, you know, where we just maybe harvest it through the sun rays or to the waves of the ocean. So then it's just, you know, all like, and I think crypto has already shown that I think it's more than half is, is really just now, you know, mined through renewable energies, right? I mean, a lot of mines have been set up, you know, in Norway, in Iceland and so on. And, uh, and, I, and I, I don't think that's really the main issue, but I think you brought something up that is also um you know like a few years ago i saw like a gold mine in 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 australia and this is really it takes you like two hours to walk around the gold mine because it's such a big i mean nobody nobody questions you know how much energy it took really to just to just dig the ground you know what you know the damage it took to to the earth there right i mean you don't really have this for you know for 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 bitcoin or for, or for but i would just say um you know there's so many other like you know, wasteful elements being, you know, used, right? I mean, the whole idea was really that if you have your own bank in your pocket, the bank, uh, the, the bank teller down, you know, down the street, uh, because, you know, that costs money to run, this costs money to build, to maintain and everything. I mean, these are like all these like little, you know, of course, these are huge. When you add them all up, but aspect is really, 
how can you make the financial system more efficient and this would be like a huge cost advantage right i mean if you i mean the whole part of eventually you do is to streamline the middle and back office of every financial institution and you know that's usually you know like even like uh, two-thirds of of every you know bank is really like middle and back office and if you don't need those people anymore uh that's of course a huge uh, overhang of you know energy consumption cost and 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 so on that would you that, that you would eliminate really right and this is like you know good then for society and good for for the earth as well so it's just really you know it's like a trade-off sometimes it just costs it just i guess goodwill to the earth right to just you know put things in place and then and then you know make it more efficient and and, and better so I think I think the streamline aspect of what you talked about is really interesting in in the awareness of the power consumption of existing systems, right? Because you have you have banks out there like money right now is already ones and zeros. Ones and zeros has to live on a computer, has to live on a server somewhere, uh, has to be managed by infrastructure. And you know, there's a there's a trend of of bank branches at least around me, like banks are are getting rid of their branches and they're moving to more app driven stuff and all of that, and that has to reside somewhere and. I worked in the data center world for like 10 years and banks have massive data centers too, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, everybody sees, uh, you know, sees, sees the, the disappearance of the branches really, right? I mean, before like every every village had a, has a branch, right? Or had a branch and this has all changed. And I think, uh, I don't wanna say the young people don't go to the bank anymore. I mean, I hardly go to the bank, right? And, and the worst thing is if you bring in like, you know, foreign currencies, I mean, they want to charge you when you deposit it, right? I mean, you take it out, they also want to charge you. I say, well, then I don't go to the bank at all. I just keep it at home. And I think that's just kind of like where, where you know, the, the, the transformation of the financial system is, you know, is really like a kind of like a, like a glacial uh, pace, right? But when, when you look at 10 years ago, it has changed, you know, miles. And I think it will change miles, you know, 10 years from now. I, I like this. Um, I wrote a piece about how sustainable, environmentally damaging Bitcoin is, Jeremy, a while ago, and the answer is not much. I can send you that uh, at mm. some point because mostly done. On post a link. Post a link in the thread. Yeah, I will. I like the idea of describing Bitcoin as the hero in the hero's journey, and he, in a place of stasis, and he go, who knows what the end will be. But talking of characters in your book, and we take it back to Crypto Titans and. I, I love the first few chapters where you speak about the history, like from day one of Bitcoin and where it is. And there are, it's a small world and a lot of the characters kind of reappear after their time in prison to fund, to create something else. I mean, let's be honest, a lot of the stories do end up in prison. But um, I was going to ask like to speak about two of my favorite characters in the first kind of years of Bitcoin. But instead, who were your favorite characters when you were researching crypto titans um yeah who were your favorite characters that you came across like the crazy dreamers of the early days yeah i think my favorite <clears throat> character is a is a chinese student in singapore <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> um <clears throat> is, a, is a is a character called ryan zhu uh he was 17 years either he went on. A, he was a Chinese student uh, in Singapore on a scholarship, um, and you know he was a loner. He was a programmer. You know, just like set up this kind of you know based on this you know forex, this foreign currency exchange kind of style uh, platform. He he set it up within like you know five, six, seven days, where people suddenly could trade Bitcoin, um, and you could even take leverage. So this is the first time you could deposit one Bitcoin and you could trade you know, uh, 10 Bitcoin. So you would suddenly take, you know, uh, nine, nine Bitcoins leverage, basically. And the interesting aspect, and this is why I think the story is so fascinating, he was a little bit like bullied out of this company. You know, there was a, you know, a venture capital investor in the US. He came, he's like, hey, you didn't build something great here. And he was making like $50,000 in the first couple of months, really, from this exchange. We're just like, you know, just hey, the program running, basically, in the background. And he was, again, a 17-year-old student. But then he was, you know, kind of told, hey, this is like, you know, against regulation and so on. And why don't you sell this exchange to me or to this, you know, uh, investor conglomerate, which he did. And other people took it over. And then, you know, there were some like hacks and some, you know, some some issues. And then and then basically 
the source code of the exchange was leaked. Somebody else picked it up. And this person built a new exchange called Bitfinex. You know, of course, changed a little bit the color and a little bit, but it was basically the same source code. And out of Bitfinex, you know, Tether, you know, USDT came and, you know, and so on, right? And of course, Tether is now the, by far the largest stable coin. It's the most important, I guess, cryptocurrency outside of, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum because it's used for every transaction. It's, it's you know, used on a lot of exchanges. So I think the interesting aspect here is maybe, you know, all these, you know, Tether would have not, you know, seen the day of light really if you didn't have this like 17 year old guy, you know, building this exchange suddenly. And then you just like think about, you know, what did I do back then? Right. And and there are like a couple of interesting examples. And, you know, the other interesting aspect is also how the how a couple of Chinese miners basically in 2013, you know, discovered how to how to mine Bitcoin, you know, a lot more efficient and a lot more powerful. And suddenly, you know, they were not winning like every week, you know, the, the puzzle to get new Bitcoins. They were winning it literally every hour. And suddenly the Bitcoin mining moved really to China because you had all these powerful miners there. And I assume you probably have like 7 million of these like 19 million Bitcoins that are mined so far. So 7 million have been probably mined in China. So that's why... You know, it's an interesting aspect. And I think the, the Chinese story is also like massively interesting how China really dominated. It was like 80, 90 percent of all the Bitcoin trading at one point was in China. And I think you can just like imagine how this, you know, Bitcoin really, uh, you know, took, took that country by storm. And I think there are like some of the aspects, you know, in the revised version that I, that I just published. There's, you know, a little bit more of those stories from the beginning, because I think this is really like fascinating how it started and how it just really like evolved then. Totally. Quick question. Quick. Sorry, just on that, just one of the things I noticed was, yeah, China, China's importance in it just can't be overestimated because they were just all of a, a lot of these people were based in Hong Kong or Shanghai in China, weren't they? And it was just essential to the evolution of Bitcoin. Yeah, I think that's that's really like really mis misunderstood, right? Or, or really not really known. Right? So um, you know, I mean, th there are these stories, uh, you know, one person, you know, I, I know, um, you know, put 10,000 Bitcoin in this company, 2012, year, a year later, the company paid, uh, 500 times the amount in, in Bitcoin out as, as a dividend or something like this. Right. I mean, these like, like really like massive amounts of, of money that was really, you know, generated there. And, you know, a lot of Bitcoins were, were produced, right. We all like to think about you know that sort of you know people kind of like you know were these technologists and looking at things but they were just really you know building industrial sized you know mining platforms really and we're just mining like a lot of bitcoin right and it's just also then used as but but i mean for me the, the most interesting aspect was because i've been in hong kong for you know for for many years but you know bitcoin was around but i didn't see some of the big you know call them macro stories where where the Chinese government basically gave the green light through, you know, so the state TV, uh, a 25 minute documentary in 2013. And they were basically saying Bitcoin is a new form of money. It can be used to send money from A to B, from, from A to B. It can be used to, to evade taxes. And of course, for the Chinese is like, oh, I can use this to evade taxes. I can use it to send money from A to B. Yeah bring it on, right? And I think that's when Bitcoin in 2012 uh, had like, uh, from 2012 to 2013, it had like a 5,000% return and it was really all driven in China. And I think it's just really like an, an interesting aspect. So I go in the book a little bit about it and, and talk about it because it's such a crucial aspect really of it, right? So I think that's kind of the stories I wanted to discover. And, and you know, you were asking me earlier, you know, how did I start writing this book? I started writing, you know, yes, you know, for example, coins have been around really started to be used in on scale in basically in, in early 2020 right it's only literally like three years ago when they were and there was one critical event and then i looked we started the company digging and suddenly i could put it all sort of like together and the, the idea is really to to put out a book and and write you know the kind of like all these little stories and and make people like aware how developed right and how the narratives of people like changed over time in these all these bull markets. 
So quick question about your, about your books the the, the if, if people were going to jump in to read one, we should probably do the yeah. second one, right? Because that's an update of the first one in a yeah. way, or how do they different? Yes. So ideally the second one, right? The Bitcoin, the irresistible rise, that's an updated one. That's 450. Um, the one that Mark was holding up, you know, crypto Titans is 400 to 420 pages. Um, I mean, the, the idea really is to come out with, uh, you know, with an, with an, with an three, every year or every two. So I hope I can run this, you know, for, you know, for, 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 for many years, because crypto is going to, you know, it's going to continue. But I think it's just really just interesting to see you know, initially how these characters change. And of course, we like to look at always, oh, if I have, would have bought, and of course, there are, there are some people around there who bought Bitcoin, you know, 2012 and never sold. And, you know, there's a lot of big whales, of course, out there. And I think the market is, is to some extent quite cornered. But I think the other interesting aspect is you have people that were there very early, 2010. Uh, you know, there's one guy who worked with Satoshi uh, quite closely. He was in Bitcoin for two years and then he sold his Bitcoin, bought a small apartment and then he quit. But he quit in 2011 or 12, you know, and then he didn't really go back. And you just think like, wow, you know, you could have been a billionaire, right? Instead of like buying this like apartment. But But I think what you have is like, waves of people entering right you have promoters you know you probably remember you know bitcoin jesus right you know roger ver and you haven't heard anything from roger ver for almost like i don't know six seven eight nine ten years right but he was very instrumental and i think this is quite interesting because you have these various promoters you have these you know various cheerleaders through the history of crypto they stay a year or two or three and then they're going to be suddenly replaced by other people and i think the there's an, also an interesting aspect with exchanges, right? You had like Mt. Gox was a very powerful exchange and you had Bitfinex and you had Bitmax and, you know, then you had, well, you know, FTX at one point, but you had like Binance now. Binance is, of course, is still very powerful, but also exchanges didn't really tend to last that long, right? And, and so, I mean, the industry is just like so fascinating because it's so fast moving, something happens and also the loyalty from you know the customer loyalty is also just not there so the customers also move very quickly from from a to b so it's very interesting what this for example blackrock you know bitcoin etf does now do to the whole industry and maybe it has a profound impact as well yeah very very interesting and i i'm i'm gonna have to get a copy of this book and maybe this could be on consideration for our next thinking on paper book club because this is this is a capability and a technology that's going to be around for a while and uh it'd be it's going to be fun to follow the story. One question I want to ask as we wrap up, because I don't want to be mindful of time here. The um, I always like to get the opinions of people who have been knee deep into technology for a while to explain it in simplest terms, right? So this ETF is going to open up the door to um, maybe older generations who are more used to the reg traditional finance, finance system to kind of go, oh, well, this thing you know, has been turned into an ETF, maybe I should figure out what it's all about, but they can't get their head around something being created from nothing. Right. And like, there's, it doesn't, it doesn't, I know we've been a long way away from the gold standard, but it doesn't point to anything that's hard and concrete. How do you explain that what it is to somebody to get them to go, Oh, I do get it. Well, I mean, as you said earlier, right. I mean, money is already like a lot of ones, a lot of zeros, I think everybody these days is using a lot of electronic payment, you know, systems as well. And I think here the, you know, the easiest explanation is really that, you know, there's a limited supply of it. You own part of, of this, you own part of the network, and you can always say, this is my number, you know, one, two, and three. And I think it can be used for, you know, for various aspects. I mean, that's really, I think, where, where it makes sense for people. But as you, I think, as you correctly said, you know, people can put it in their portfolios through an ETF, but then they're probably, oh, maybe I should learn a little bit more about it. And I think that's really where we enter now a really a, a bigger wave, I think, of adoption where people want to learn. They want to be, uh, you know, informed about it. So one aspect I think is quite valuable is, you know, maybe the, you know, the the, the private bank uh, CEO doesn't really talk want to talk about Bitcoin, but I think all his clients want to talk about it, right? They want to know about it because... What's all the fuss about it, right? My son is telling me, like, I think I remember like the conversation like three, four years ago was a lot like, 
these older people were like, oh yeah, you know, my son is asking me about it, so I should learn about it too, right? And I think that's how how the transformation really really begins. And I think, um, you know, it's just very interesting from um, you know from just you know you're buying a part of a technology network really right and i think that's kind of the way to to explain it to people they understand that you know and you know the other aspect is also that people look at it as sort of like as a as a as a digital gold right so um and i think you can show through historical analysis if there is cash or something happening bitcoin tends to rally and i think as a protection as a store of money as a store of value as buying a piece of the technology puzzle I think people understand those arguments quite well. That's a really interesting way to think about it. Buying a piece of of a technology network or, or technology part of the network, right? Because we we we've said it like four or five times on the show, like the value of networks, the value of interconnection, network effects has been studied, you know, ad nauseum over the last hundred years or whatever, right? So that's a really interesting way to think about it. Um, I, I think we're I think we're close to needing to wrap, Marcus. I I would love to dig deeper. I plan on acquiring your newest book, and I think if people want to learn more about all of this and learn about it in a fascinating way, they should check it out. Um, Mark, I'm sure you'll post links and all that good stuff, right? Yeah, I, I will. And I think that to understand the present and understand the future, where do you look? You look to the past, and I think understanding where Bitcoin came from the people involved, why it materialized, how it materialized, how it evolved. And you can learn all that in Crypto Titans. I think it helps you to, to understand what is happening and what could possibly happen. Um, I don't have any hot button questions, but maybe um, I've got two questions with a one word answer that maybe I could ask Marcus. The first is my NFT friends would kill me if they didn't get the word ordinals so ordinals are they something or nothing well it's you know ordinals are an inscription really right so um but i think it just shows it's another road coin could become what you know what and again right so there is like a core uh, a core developer community that wouldn't agree that ordinals are going to be, you know, part of the Bitcoin story, but I think it just shows that if there is a large community or large use case, Bitcoin will find its way. It's a little bit like, you know, like water. It will it will go where the most demand is, and I think that's kind of like really an interesting aspect that that is just very very fluid. And I think that's an interesting aspect of of crypto. So so who knows what the future really brings? I think it's just very difficult to say. Okay, and last one, yes or no. How finny is Satoshi? No. Okay, brilliant. Thank I, you, I, I thought, Marcus. I, I thought I thought so, but I revealed a little bit who I thought it's in the second book or in the updated one. Okay. So Jeremy might know. <laughs> so, yeah. Wonderful. I, I, I thought you said, yeah. Anyway, so Marcus, Marcus, thanks so much for joining. This is this has been enlightening. I know it's a it's a hot topic right now, and and one that everyone is really interested in understanding and figuring out I want to say thanks again to ripple w-r-i-p-p-l-e our uh, lead sponsor for thinking on paper they are marketing's on-demand talent platform great at stacking teams for those quick projects as we kick off q1 tons of uh, vetted uh solopreneur freelancers in there that uh, to the tune of about three thousand big companies are using them uh i'd consider reaching out to them if you need to flex and add to your team. Mark, we have a book club. Tell everyone what's going on speaking of books. Book club, yeah, it's just down there in, in the in the, the ticker tape along the bottom. Yeah, we have a book club, a thinking on paper book club, where me, Jeremy, and the community talk about a book. We learn together, and at the moment we're reading The Design of Everyday Things, which is a, an awesome book about the, the mindset and the frameworks of good UX, and I think that anyone in web three who wants to learn about what good ux is then they should join the book club thinking on paper dot xyz and ps if you're not a if you don't want to read the book uh we create these amazing videos of uh breaking down chapter True. by chapter so you can participate as much or as little as you want we just want you jumping in and hanging with us yeah. thanks again for joining uh thinking on paper dot xyz is the website you can find us on all sp uh, uh podcast platforms as well as on YouTube. Stay disruptive, stay curious, 
stay thinking on paper take it easy guys bye